restraints have been released. Push up on your shoulder harness and carefully exit the ride. And our guest tonight, we are honored to have TJ Wilson, a Stampede British Commonwealth Mid-Heavyweight Champion, two-time Stampede Heavyweight Champion, Stampede Tag Team Champion twice, once with Bruce Hart, once with Juggy, amongst many, many other accomplishments, a uh, WWE Tag Team Champion. We are more than happy to welcome TJ Wilson. Welcome, TJ. Hey, guys. Hey, thanks a lot for having me. It's funny when you read those back. It's funny, like, my two tag team title runs in Stampede are with Bruce and with Juggernaut. Like, you think, obviously, Harry or Ted, but no. Yeah, yeah. And and, and two very, very different workers. Uh, and um, the tr so when I was a team with Bruce, I actually replaced Teddy. Uh, they were oh. the tag team first. And then I kind of take Teddy's spot. And it, I learned a lot during those matches because it would be, it'd be like myself and Bruce against, like, uh, Dave Swift and, and Apocalypse. And, it, dude, we might, we might go, like, 25 30 minutes and so like yeah, i you know it was it was it was a lot of on the fly training and i'd be like i would do some kind of you know it'd be the heat on me and I, i'd be kind of starting to like come and reach for the tag to bruce and bruce would, under his breath be like not yet not yet and then like so just like i would just be in that ring for felt like an hour just like heat <laughs> on me and i'd be like do we do something else this is like this was all like on the fly like all improv and i'm like Crawling a tag to Bruce again, like not not quite yet. A little bit more heat, like. <laughs> <laughs> it was a really good experience, and I, I got to wrestle a lot of guys in a little bit in a, uh, in a different style than than normal. Like before, like if I'm teaming with Bruce, I'm I'm not gonna. It's not gonna be the same as teaming with Teddy, where you know there's a lot of quick tags, and we're both kind of doing a similar style. This is this is where I started to really learn how to like develop like. Uh, my style and let it contrast with the, my teammate's style or my opponent's style being completely different. And how, how does that work out? And when you're, you know, 22 years old, you don't, you don't, you might think you know the answers, but you don't know them all. So you're figuring them out. And uh, yeah. it, I learned a lot. I learned a lot in both of those tag teams, but it was funny reading it back because Harry and I won the PWA tag team titles, but not Stampede Wrestling. Just kind of interesting. Yeah. You know, and, and it must force a really, interesting uh ring iq because i've always maintained that i don't think there's a more naturally gifted athlete in wrestling than teddy like oh, man, everything, yeah. everything teddy did was effortless like yeah. and, and he did he did the most amazing stuff effortlessly you know and then bruce is very old school and juggy juggy 400 pounds and the guy does drop kicks and, and runs the ropes like a guy half his size and and like it's very hard hitting again oh, very, yeah. different, <laughs> diff, very different very hard hitting. uh first time i wrestled him i remember he said the two things he's like uh bump fast on the clothesline and the kick to the back just hurts like all right and then uh, <laughs> yeah he, he was yeah I, I he didn't lie to me <laughs> he didn't tell a lie juggernaut he told me the yeah. truth that kick to the back hurt and uh, so does the clothesline. <laughs> yeah, but but I, but in a, like a good way. I, I always had I had a lot of fun wrestling against Juggernaut and teaming with them. Yeah, you, you would think like it might be a weird contrast, but like I love I love like David versus Goliath. It's I, it's 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 easy, but it's also fun to try to kind of do different spins on on a, on an old story. Yeah. Well, and it teaches you, you know, I think, you know, in those David versus Goliath matches, it's, it's a really fine line on the cell. If you, yeah, yeah. if you oversell, you kill yourself, you kill your own heat. Yeah. If you yeah. undersell, well, they'll probably not be too happy about it. <laughs> if, if, for example, if, if you're to undersell in there at that time against Juggernaut, uh, <laughs> In a few seconds, in a few seconds, I'm sure your cell be quite appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, you know, uh, going back, Ellen and I, we we really shouldn't have done this, but you know, we had we had a lot of fun working together. Uh, one of the trainees, Richard, was working with Jerry Morrow, and, and Jerry is is uh, 
is tough as nails. I love Jerry. He's just, just a brilliant guy. Champagne Jerry Morrow. Just one of the toughest guys you'll ever meet. Classic and, yeah. wrestling heel, like phenomenal heel. Like as I'm a kid, I like I thought Jerry Morrow and and uh and Cuban Assassin, I thought they were like the best tag team in the world when I was like <laughs> yeah. yeah, and you know, and I just love Jerry. And Jerry was very, very serious about about wrestling and his craft. Yeah. And Ellen and I were in a bit of a mood. So I, I pulled Richard aside and said, you know what? Jerry really, really, really likes you. What he wants you to do is when he does the headbutt, no sell it. Oh. <laughs> Poor Richard. <laughs> It probably didn't go very well for, for poor Richard. Yeah, no, no. And so they got to the headbutt spot, and Jerry, you know, did the whole thing and headbutted him. And Richard just registered, just stood there looking at him. And, uh, uh. And I know the headbutt, Jerry does this, like, jumping headbutt. Yeah. Right? Where they're both standing, that one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's no... <laughs> <laughs> poor Jerry. I say poor Jerry, I mean poor Richard, because... Yeah, uh, but Jer but Jerry also I mean, he has a good heart. So yeah, well he he really didn't at that point. <laughs> <laughs> the anger took over a little bit, and the good heart part of the part of the, part of the, the red sea. <laughs> yeah, no, I Ellen and I felt bad about it afterwards. We we have to admit. <laughs> yeah, but in the spirit of a rib, it's not, you know, nobody's going to get like hurt, hurt. So it's in the moment, it's so funny and you don't realize what, how maybe bad it could possibly be. But you, but you also know it's probably not going to get to that extreme or you're you obviously, you know, bad news Allen could easily break it up. If any, you know what I'm saying? Like, so you're yeah. not that worried about it getting too crazy. Yeah. Well, I, and that's the thing. I, bad news was legitimately one of the toughest guys to ever lace up a pair of boots and, and, and no one no one messed around when Ellen was or around. lace a pair of shoes or put on a pair of socks maybe yeah yeah absolutely absolutely I, I just loved Ellen and learned so much from him so so I guess that's kind of a, a long segue back to uh how you got started TJ how did you get started in this wacky business man so I I went to school with uh with Teddy, um, initially we were in different grades. We're the same age, but I I failed ECS actually. Um, I think I missed a bunch of days, and um, I honestly don't really know remember why I failed ECS the first time. And then so the next year I did like ECS in the morning, and then grade one in the afternoon, and then the following year I I was just in first grade, and then so anyway, so I was a year behind, and. Uh, Ted came to my school when I was in second grade, so he would have been in third. We weren't friends that year, and we're not friends the next year. The next year, <laughs> I'm in third grade for like three months, and I um, I was actually friends with Ted's sister a little bit, Angie, at the time, oh, yeah. and because uh, we were in the same grade. Then I did, in third grade, I did two weeks of this provincial testing, and um, they advanced me to fourth grade. So now I was in Ted's class, but I, I was avoiding him. And <laughs> Cause he was mouthy, but like, so was I, but I knew he was a little bit, he was a little bit more extreme than I was. And I, I just thought it was a bit of a clash. So I just didn't want to, I don't know. I tried not to be his friend. And he, and he had this weird thing where he wanted to be my friend. So it was a funny, like cat and mouse game of, for some reason, this guy wanted to be my friend, especially. So the next year of fifth grade where we had become friends and um, we had, we had mutual friends. So I just remember thinking like, well, I'm not going to be able to avoid this guy like an, an entire year again. So we may as well, <laughs> may as well be friends with him. And uh, after a little bit of convincing, he convinced me to come to his house. And um, kept telling me he lived in a gym. And that as, if nothing else, I would at least go home with, with an ice cream cone. And because uh, <laughs> BJ's, BJ's had the ice cream at the time. So uh, I just remember finally giving in and saying, okay, actually, you know what? The first time I went to his house, I remember it was, um, this is why his parents, okay. I, I couldn't remember why his parents didn't pick him up that day. I now remember why it was in the middle of a field trip. And on the way back to the school, we didn't go back to the school. We went to his house. We, which like, you're not allowed to do. You were not supposed to do, especially, 
you're not allowed to leave the the property until like the teachers get you back to the school and you're not the you know you're not the school's res responsibility anymore but we just left and i remember the teacher saying like guys guys you have to come back we were just like waving like bye see you tomorrow <laughs> but like what was what was the teacher gonna do was he gonna leave the other 20 students to come chase us like no so we took <laughs> Took the other 20 back to school and uh, we probably got in some trouble the next day. But uh, my introduction to, to Teddy and his family uh, had be, already begun. So it was already, it, uh, you know, get me in a little bit of trouble the next day. But the, the, the damage was already done. It was already a little bit too late. And uh, <laughs> I, so I go, to, I go to his gym, which I'm thinking of a gymnasium is what most kids would think of. I'm not realizing it's going to be a, a workout gym, let alone one of the more hardcore gyms in the city with all these bikers and all this yeah. Yeah, <laughs> all these wrestlers cool. these bikers so he introduced Baltimore. me to a, a girl who was doing the exercise bike and told me oh this is george and i was like why is he introduced me to members now like this is so weird <laughs> that's not that's not a member that was his mom uh, yeah. He, yeah. He, he always refer refers to his parents as their as bj and george which are his parents names so um it, again it just was wacky a little bit from the get-go of a gym and this woman's name is george but it's actually his mom and it was just a lot to take in and uh you know so then a couple years later you know and i start going around the stews and stuff i, I start going almost instantly going up to like sunday dinners and stuff like that and we're Going down in the in the basement at the time, we're just we're calling it a basement, but little do we know the dungeon and what uh I mean we knew from from watching I knew from watching superstars out here, Gorilla Monsoon mentioned the dungeon and stuff like that. But you you know, we're kids, we're down there playing, it's the basement, it's not the dungeon until you know, fast forward a few years later when Stu's coming down to stretch me, then it's dungeon. It's, I, yeah. I, it's damn sure a dungeon when Stu's coming down yeah. there to stretch me. But when we're down there, there's kids playing soccer and stuff down there. It's a basement. But I was going up to Stu's and Sunday dinner and just getting to really to know the whole family. And I just kind of got – I always joke about it. I got, like, snowballed in and there just was, like, no way out. <laughs> and I'm okay with that. I'm not complaining about that. But, um, yeah, then, uh, you know, fast forward a little bit. I remember seeing SummerSlam 92, Brett, Brett versus Davey. And mm. – um, something inside of me like clicked and the 12 year old me at that moment like was like aha this is what you're going to do for the rest of your life and sometimes i'd like to you know pull up a chair and put my arm around him and talk to that 12 year old and wonder where did his confidence come from like there was there was no there was no no doubt about making it to wwe and no doubt about this is what i was going to do for the rest of my life no need for a b plan this was it and I don't know where that 12 year old understood or had that kind of focus or confidence. It's insane. like, look, when I think about it now, I'm almost 42. It's scary. It's scary to think about putting all my eggs in one basket. Like it's scary, man. I don't know. I don't know why that 12 year old version of me would had no, no problem doing that. Um, but then was the question of how, like, okay, cool. But now, not how though, how? Well, I knew I have to grow up and get older and eventually I would get bigger. I thought it just naturally, but it just happens as you get older. It hey, your metabolism slows down as you get older, but you don't just naturally get bigger. You have to put in the work. Um, <laughs> so then Rockyford Rodeo was a show. Well, it's a town, Rockyford, Alberta, and they had run a, they have a rodeo for a weekend or something every, every summer. And Stu, long after Stampede had been, sold and then restarted and then shut back down in the, in the in the late 80s Stu was still running these shows like i remember there was a plaque from maybe like 98 or something in Stu's office that uh said like 25 years of Stu Hart and the Rockyford Rodeo it was this plaque and that was like 97 or 98 so i mean like these even though Stampede stopped at the end of 89 like these shows kept happening and so in 94 um, Ted and his sister came to my house. They wanted to borrow my video camera for Harry and Matt, Ted's brother, Matt. And, um, and of course, Harry, we're, we're going to have a match at Rockyford. Uh, Harry being eight years old and, <laughs> and Matt being 11. And, uh, 
So they came to my house to borrow my video camera. I had a video camera for whatever reason. My mom bought a video camera. So they wanted to borrow it to film this match. And then they wanted me to come. Then I just was like, no, I had a friend over. And I was like, no, I'm not going to go. I'm just going to stay here. And um, my friend was like, well, actually, I'm, I'm going to go home soon. Then I was like, oh, okay. So he's going to leave soon. I'm going to lend out my camera. And then I'm going to kind of be at home by myself. So sounds like going to this wrestling show is better than that by a lot. And uh, I, I've been bitten by the bug, but almost like it kind of like I, I hadn't I hadn't done any training or anything yet, so it was like, like I said, that after I saw Summer Seven Ninety Two, I knew this what I was gonna do, but I just didn't know the how and I didn't know the when, so I just figured like ah, uh, I'll just kind of, I guess hang out till I'm eighteen and then I'll train and then I'll become a wrestler, obviously. <laughs> um, so. I, so I was like, I, you know, I was kind of in that mind mind frame of like, well, I guess I'm just like, I, I'm not 18 yet. I'm not even 16. So like, what are, like, I, I can't go wrestle yet anyway. So I just remember being like, I was bit by it. I would, I would watch superstars all week long. I would record it um, and I, all week long until the next week, I just would watch it on repeat over and over watching like Razor Ramon beat Dwayne Gill like 77 times in a week, you know, <laughs> it is what it is. And, uh, so uh, my friend's going to leave, and I'm like, you know what? I'll, I'll go. I'll go with you. So Ted and I sat in the front row, and we watched Harry and Matthew have this match. And it was, a, it was a minute long or something, but I just remember being, like, first off, like, super nervous for them, insanely proud of them, and just, like, like absolutely inspired. Like, I, Ted and I literally looked at each other and, like, said the exact same thing like at the exact same thing it was like next year we're going to be in there too and it just was like it was, again it was it was that same weird mindset of like boom this is it that that's all there is to it this is it and and then uh then we started we started um doing we were doing amateur wrestling but we would we would amateur wrestle on like tuesdays and thursdays at bj's at this this uh this whole school year but we would go there right after school our school would get out at like 2 30 and we'd go we go to bj's right after school the amateur wrestling practice wasn't until like six we get to bj's it'd be like three in the afternoon so for like three hours we would like we would film these matches of us like you know we would wrestle on amateur um pads but all of our bumps and stuff would be on like on a big crash pad and we used a little step ladder as like the top rope. And we would, you know, do drop kicks off this step ladder. And everything was like the easiest bump ever because we're laying on these crash pads. <laughs> uh, little did we real like, once in a while, you know, it'd be like, let's see what it feels like to take the suplex on the amateur mat and like maybe go to do it, and be like, ah, next time, next time. And then back to the crash <laughs> pad. But yeah, and um, and so it just kind of like then I broke my wrist. I broke my wrist. Um, I'm trying to remember, I don't know the exact, but June, June of '95, I broke my wrist, and Rockyford is in July, so I knew I didn't have quite enough time to for my wrist to heal to be able to um, have this match. And I was like, "Oh my god, I ruined it! I'm gonna, I broke, I broke my wrist doing a drop kick off the top rope, and we weren't, we weren't allowed, to, we weren't supposed to be doing any moves off the top rope." So I, I mean, I'm sure everybody knows. Uh, in the family that knew this story. But to this day, I've never quite just come out and say, hey, everybody, it actually was a drug kick off the top. It wasn't just a normal drug kick like I told you for the last 30 years, but that's what, what it was. It was a drug kick off the top rope, and we just said it was a drop kick, and I landed wrong. I, I landed wrong, but it was off the top. Mm. Um, and I remember having to go in. They casted my arm, and I had to go in right around my finals, that the end of the June, I had to go in for like an x-ray to see how the bone was healing. But instead of healing like straight on, it was healing like overlapping. Oh. And and so my doctor was like, hey, do you want to do you want to do it now or do you want to come back later today? And I was like, what's that? And she's like, we have to reset your wrist. It's not healing properly. It's not growing properly. We have to reset it. And um, and I was like, well, does that mess up the uh, the healing time? She's like, oh, yeah, it's a it's re reset. It's back to six weeks again. And I was thinking, like, I'm already trying to get this thing off early as it is to try. Like, I don't, it's, 
it's a Hail Mary for sure. I don't think we're having a match this summer. It's, uh, I'm not. But it's like, if I get this reset, it's for sure no. So I said, uh, can I do it later on? And she said, yeah, no problem. I've never seen that doctor ever again. <laughs> that was my family, like, physician. My, my sister still and my mom still see her. I have never seen her again. <laughs> Sorry, Dr. Savoya. I just, I couldn't, I couldn't have my wrist reset. Um, so fast forward to like, uh, a, the, maybe a week before Rocky for that year. So like the first weekend of July, maybe, uh, I remember Teddy shows up at my house and he said, Hey, I've been trying to call you. And I didn't realize like my, my phone was, I accidentally been knocked off the hook and like in those days, you know, phones are what they are now. It's a different, he couldn't get a hold of me. It just was a busy signal. Um, uh, so he said, hey, listen, we have to cut your cast off and we have to have this match tomorrow. Uh, so this is a Friday. He said, tomorrow, Saturday morning at like 10, we have to show Ross Hart what we can do. He said, Harry and Matt have a match and you and I have a match. He's like, they said they're only picking one. So we have to go out do those guys. So I was like, ah, what? Like, okay, we're in like a weird competition with like our friends, you know, Ted's brother and Ted's cousin. My friends that were in this competition with them like this is my first taste of pro wrestling okay got it <laughs> little did i know what i was in for but okay yeah, yeah. and uh i remember i kudos to my mom i don't know how i don't know how i convinced her to cut the cast off early i just told her my wrist felt good i remember we cut it off it felt really like my arm felt really light and i was so skinny that my my cast for the first two weeks was up to my bicep because they they casted it where my elbow was stuck in a bent position. So I cut that part off after two weeks and it like, I remember it hurt so much to even straighten my arm. Now cutting this cast off, my arm felt weak. I knew like from my doctor that it wasn't healing right. But a friend of mine said his collarbone healed like that and from hockey and said that it actually, his doctor, who knows, but his doctor at that point had told him it actually healed stronger because the bone had grown over and then thus caused more, more growth, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> so I just wanted I wanted to pretend that logic made a lot of sense and so I was gonna use it too that uh that it growing over like that was gonna make my wrist even stronger. So uh I mean to be fair, I've never injured it again, so maybe it did. Uh, uh, see, you were right, it's stronger than ever. But I remember I remember cutting it off and then like wrapping it and then Ted and I that night going in like um just I would say creating a match, but we didn't create a match. We we watched a bunch of matches and s stole things we saw. Like, okay, Brett and Davey at SummerSlam did this. We I remember we wrote it down on a piece of paper. Like, okay, let's put in this videotape. Put in another videotape. Okay, we like that. All right. right. <laughs> Eject in play. No, fast forward. No, rewind. Oh, there. Okay, yeah. Okay, let's go down and practice these things. Like, so we, we went down. We we tried them out. Whatever. We don't want to kind of like it's so funny we don't want to show matt and harry our match they don't want to show us their match um <laughs> we all anyway i think matt and harry end up the next morning they go first they go first and uh, i think they said i think matt told told us he said hey guys it's ross already said it's a tag match so then like we ted i remember we're a little bit older than matt and harry and ted's always been a little bit like He's always been sly like that. And he was like, we shouldn't even do the match at all then. But he's like, if it's a tag, why do we have to do this match? He's never been a morning person. So he's like, why do we have to do this match at 9 a.m.? If, if we already know it's going to be a tag, let's just do the tag. <laughs> but Ross still wanted to see what we could do. We, we showed him our match. He said, that was a good job, uh, but we're going to do a tag. Like, all right. So then for the next, like, week, we were up training at the du – up at Stu's. The ring – I'd say the dungeon, but the ring – it was July. The ring was set up outside. So we are out there. Maybe maybe like ten days. I don't I don't think it was two weeks, but it might have been. It might have been two weeks of like of like cramming for a final exam without ever taking the course. Basically, is what, is what it was like. My whole career is all these like near misses. Like I almost didn't go to the Rocky Ford in '94. If I didn't go there, I wouldn't have been bit so hard by that bug that I have to do this one in '95. That I have to cut my cast off or like breaking my wrist. Like that should have definitely taken me out of it, but. I've been bit so bad by that last time that that time I was there and not the year before that I had to be there this time. I didn't care what it took. So like my, my, a lot of my career has a lot of those where it's these near misses. Like it almost, it almost doesn't happen. It almost like mm, magically, like at the, you know, 11th hour, get the okay. And away we go. And this was another one of those exactly that. 
So then we're up at Stu's cramming and cramming and cramming for this match. And the matches, there's a version. Uh, I had a version of this match. There, there is one at, at uh, Ted's parents have it somewhere, but I haven't seen it in a few years. But um, the match is like three minutes long. But uh, <laughs> just, but in the moment, man, I would just remember being so nervous and just being so scared and intimidated. I just, those three minutes felt like two hours. And uh, the the best part, the best part of my first match, I think, was. <laughs> on the ride home the ride home or in the back of uh bj had a van and the we all rode together in the van and now we're all riding back and uh you know we have the match on video camera and we're all it, i i didn't it, it wasn't one of those video cameras and it, it was just you know it was 1995 it was one of those video cameras that like had the thing pop out on the side and you can watch the screen all together yeah. you had to like watch it through the eyepiece oh so yeah it'd be like yeah. i i watched for three minutes then i pass it to to, like so we're all passing it around <laughs> and watching the match and when you watch it through that it also has no color it's like it's like mm. blue like that blue tinge or whatever the black yeah. and white with some blue and um so anyway we're passing around we're watching this match we're excited once we get back to um to bj's we can hook it up to the tv and we can watch it with proper color and everything and think we're these giant stars and things like that but in this moment we're just watching in the camera and i just remember Diana Hart being back there with me. And um, we, you know, everybody was praising us. And Diana said, like, you guys did a great job. That match was, like, so good, blah, blah. She, everyone was so super positive. But then, you know, uh, Diana's been in the wrestling business her entire life. So yeah. she she wanted to – it's her instinct is to protect the wrestling business. So she yeah. – She kayfabe the whole thing. Oh, my God, dude. So she says to me, she's like, hey, just so you know – like your guys' match was like that. Like you guys have been planning it um, at Stu's for the last like whatever week or whatever. She's like, just so you know, the other matches aren't like that. Which that part's true. The other matches weren't up at Stu's going over their stuff. That part's true. But she said, she said along the lines of like the other matches are like real. They just let us do hours like this because we're kids, so that way we can get around like it being too violent. Or s she she worded it in a way that like. Sounded very like logical and and smart, but I was thinking I was in the locker room. I saw the other guys talking and stuff. <laughs> I, I I saw Ken Johnson talking to Steve Rivers. I know I understood what they were talking about. Sunset Flip, O'Connor. I understood these things. <laughs> but I but ten out of ten for effort of of keeping kayfabe. Ten out of ten, hundred yeah. percent. That was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Starting out, TJ. What was the hardest thing for you to learn? Because you you have a heck of a mind for the business, you really do. But what was were what was the hardest thing? Uh, and that and that kind of light bulb moment when you go, oh oh, that's yeah. The first light bulb moment is in the van <clears throat> with Ross Hart, hundred percent. But in the in the beginning, everything's hard. <clears throat> Taking bumps, it hurts, especially in that dungeon. Triple hurts. Uh, yeah, everything's hard at first, but the first, like, you know, then you pick up little things like, okay, the bumps don't hurt as bad. Like, bumps never, it doesn't go away. It doesn't, the mat, the mat doesn't magically turn to my bed or a trampoline like some people <laughs> may think. It never, but you just, your body gets more callous. You get used to it. It's just like, if I, if I go put myself in my seatbelt, put my seatbelt on and smash my car every day, you know, on the third week, I'm sure it hurts a little bit less. Because you're just your body's like, oh, here comes this this idiot's putting us through this again. Here we go, and you cry, you know, like, you you just get used to it. I'm not you. You're, it doesn't get. I don't know that it gets easier. Your body's like, oh, here comes this thing again. Uh, but the first light bulb moment is 100. percent I can remember it so clearly. I remember like driving down Sarcy Trail with with Ross. We're going to an out of town show. Bruce is driving. Um, Carl Duke or somebody is sitting in the front seat in, in the passenger seat. So Ross is in like that first back row and I'm either I'm, I'm in the row behind him, but he, so I'm able to like hang up front and kind of talk to Ross where he's sitting at like diagonal in front of me. And it just like, I just remember being like Ross, like a, I understand like, like a good guy does this and a bad guy, you know, more or less does that. And, but like, how, like, where, where, how does this, and I just remember in that, 
for whatever reason. I know Bruce had, been, Bruce had explained it so many times, but for some reason in that van, Ross explaining to me the psychology and like what these terms mean, like rather than just hearing like, oh, shine, like Ross explains to me what is shine. It's basically I'm educating the audience that who's the good guy. If this is the good guy, what is it? What are his strengths? He's a great wrestler. Cool. Show it. Oh, he's a great brawler. Cool. Show it. Okay. Got it. Here's the heat. And Ross really like was very patient with me in that van, in that van ride. And, you know, might've had like an hour and a half or two hour ride. So I guess you could look at it one way and say, well, what else is there to do to pass that time? But he didn't have to, you know, step by step, break everything down for me to such detail that like, I literally to that in that moment understood it. And like, obviously it's, evolved and developed since but it's the same psychology i use to this day is like what i learned what i learned uh from ross in that car i just apply other concepts to that foundation it's like anything it's like you can build the most beautiful house and if you build it on swamp land it in you know, two years it's going to be sunken in the ground if you don't have the right foundation so it's yeah. like anything you need you need a proper foundation and ross bruce bruce I have to mention him also because he kept he would he would teach it a lot, but it'd be more like with everybody in the dungeon. And this this one time in the van, for whatever reason, Ross was able to get through to me, speaking me one on one, and it like, I mean, it was like, a, it was like a a panel of stadium lights went off in my head. Like, got it. I finally understand this piece. And then you realize, oh my god. That piece can like, that piece is like a Jenga puzzle. It's it's not just one way. You can you can build that thing up so many different ways and like, and that's what to me is the most some of the most fun of of professional wrestling. Absolutely, and and we'll take a quick break at this point. Then we'll come back and we'll discuss exactly that the psychology of putting a match together step by step with one of the masters of it, T.J. Wilson. We'll be right back in a moment. <laughs> 